Our dear Heavenly Father, we just pause a minute, Lord, to thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness to us. And as we're going to study tonight, Lord, your grace, would you guide us? Would you help us to have open hearts and open minds and to hear the lesson, the word, the applications, the encouragement that you have for us in your word tonight? And Lord, that we would take it from here, not just for ourselves, but share it with others, and especially all the more this uh, holiday season as we approach Thanksgiving here. We've got so much to be thankful for and uh, look forward to what you have in store for each of us this evening. In your name we pray. Amen. So if you open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, we're looking at the miracles of Jesus. And uh, part two, I should say, seems like I had part two in Sermon on the Mount, and now I've got part two in the Miracles of Jesus, but part two, so let's go back just a little bit to catch up from last week. Last week, we're in Matthew chapter eight, and we ended up at the very end of that chapter, verses 33 and 34, with Jesus taking the legion and casting him into the swine, the swine running down hill and being drowned in the sea, that being the Sea of Galilee, or some translations might say a lake. And I just take that last two verses because this week we're going to instantly transition from that point to this point in chapter 9. But before we do that tonight, our doctrine tonight is grace, and my aim tonight is Jesus' grace, which is the power to forgive His power to forgive sinners and overcome death proving his authority, okay? Jesus' grace, which is his power to forgive sinners and overcome death, which prove his authority. My first division tonight is going to be Matthew 9, verses 1 to 17, the first 17 verses. I've got two divisions. So number one is Jesus demonstrates his authority to forgive sin and save sinners. So like I just said, we ended chapter 8 with the legion being... Jesus casting the legion into the swine, then running down to the sea and drowning. At that point, the whole town, Scripture tells us, came out to see Jesus. They weren't really happy. They were complaining, um, complaining because the swine was their livelihood. That's how the predominant income for that specific town was. And in that complaining, they were, I'd say nicely they asked, but they were pretty much insistent that he leave. And so he and the disciples turned around to leave, got in the boat to go across the Sea of Galilee. And, um, you know, last week we're seeing Jesus demonstrate his authority over disease, his disciples, creation, and demons. And so look this week and how through this scripture and these 17 verses you see his authority uh, to forgive sinners and overcome death. So he's in the boat with his disciples. He's going to his hometown across the sea, which is Capernaum. And shortly thereafter, a lot of it in Matthew, Matthew doesn't record some of the details. So if you're taking notes, I'd give you a scripture of Mark 2, 1 to 12. Mark 2, 1 to 12. And this is what fills in a lot of the details in the story I'm going to tell you. So he gets to the other side, barely out of the boat. Again, a lot of people had gathered to see him, to hear him, to come to him, uh, to be healed for many different things. And you get the idea that there's a home there, a house there, and just crowds of people you can't get through. Maybe in context tonight in our town here in Tampa, I'd equate it to a Bucks game, you know? You can't just walk to your seat. You've got to stand in line, fight the crowds perhaps. Maybe it was something like that. But the big part of the story really starts in verse 2 with a paralyzed man. You know, he couldn't walk. He was with his friends. His friends was bringing him to Jesus. They wanted to put him in front of Jesus. In fact, more than that, they were committed, committed to putting him in front of Jesus. And so much so that they couldn't get through the lines. They couldn't get through the people. So scripture tells us again in Mark 2, 1 to 12, some of the Extremes, I think it's an extreme that they went to to do that, to accomplish that. That they got to the building, the home, the house where Jesus was. They went up on the roof. Many of you know the story probably, 
right? They cut a hole in the roof. Their friend was on a stretcher. They got some ropes and lowered him literally right in front of Jesus. So picture, if you will, not me, but picture Jesus standing here in a hole in the roof. I mean, it's not just an instant hole, right? Even if you have the sawzall, the right tools, whatever the tools might be, you're going to have debris falling, presumably. So major distraction. You're laughing, so you're with me. Major distraction um, of different things going on. So Jesus takes notice of the man coming down on the stretcher and being right in front of him. And it was an opportunity for Jesus to offer grace. Again, our doctrine tonight, to offer grace. He offers that to all desperate people. And in this case, the paralytic man was desperate. He was desperate for powerful, life-changing grace. And notice that Jesus' response was different when you look at Scripture. You know, not just noticing him, but stopping everything he was doing to focus on that one man at the time. And uh, one of our leaders in our meeting Thursday night used the word lavished. I like that. You know, grace is God's kindness poured out. But poured out sounds too vanilla to me. Lavished? That sounds a little richer, a little more depth, a little more substance maybe. But God's kindness poured out on the undeserving. So this man was undeserving. And God looked at him, saw his friend's faith, Scripture tells us, and addressed him personally and said, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Now, there's no interaction. Jesus just sees this, knowing the man's condition because he's Jesus, knowing his heart, knowing his need. And, and I picture myself probably a little more because I read the story in Mark a couple times. But again, if it's me with three other guys bringing our guy on a stretcher to Jesus, so I don't do well in the heat and humidity. So I'm going to be hot. I'm going to be sweaty. I'm going to be uncomfortable might be dirty. Who knows how they got up on the roof? You're going to be a little exhausted, perhaps, carrying your buddy. Because he's probably not your 140-pound buddy. He's probably your 285-pound buddy, maybe, you know? Right? Let's just have a little fun with this story, perhaps. Um, but the best thing they knew to do for their friend was place him at Jesus' feet. They had faith. They were committed that if they placed their friend at Jesus' feet, Jesus could and would heal him. Incredible faith. And I think one of the lessons we can see for all of us, one of the applications there is, you know, you and I have the opportunity to take our friends, our family, our loved ones, and we can place them at Jesus' feet. Thankfully, we don't have to carry them and put a hole in the roof. You know, we can do it through prayer and intercede for them on their behalf. And um, many times we don't know what to do. We don't know how to respond. But the best way to respond and the best thing to do is to put them at Jesus' feet and let Jesus uh, take care of them. Jesus knew, back to our story, Jesus knew the man's unhealthy condition, but he went deeper than the physical that everybody else sees, right? He went to the heart, like we talk about, of his greatest need. And a lot of the Pharisees there started questioning, you know, who does he think he is? What's going on? He can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. What does he think he's doing? You know, you can see some of those attitudes, some of those thoughts maybe manifest, or maybe even hear them, depending where you were in the crowd. And again, Scripture tells us Jesus knew their thoughts. He knew their thoughts. I don't miss this. He knows our thoughts. He knows my thoughts. He knows your thoughts equally. And um, he addressed them as the evil thoughts in their hearts. And he asked them, you know, what's easier to say? Is it easier to say that your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to say, get up and walk? So he's challenging them in a way, right? Verse 6, if you have your Bibles open, look at verse 6 with me. I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus speaking. It's what he wants them to know. It's what he wants us to know tonight. It's what he wants you to know. That he has the authority as the Son of Man on earth to forgive sins. 
your sins, my sins, our sins. And so he looked at the paralyzed man and he instructed him, take up your mat and go home. What do you think happened? <laughs> he stood up, took his mat, and went home. Through faith, he believed in Jesus' authority to forgive him, to heal him. You know, Jesus' authority was different because the origin was different, right? The origin was God. God gave him, Son of Man, God gave him his authority. And as a result of that, Scripture records and tells us that the crowd praised God. So what a great response. And again, everything's pointing to God the Father. This man's physical condition demonstrates that human effort can't contribute in any way, shape, or form to the grace that God extends to us. He didn't deserve it, right? He wanted it. He needed it. But he didn't deserve it, perhaps. Salvation was by grace alone, in the gracious heart of God. And then in the middle here, in verse 9, interesting how Matthew kind of interjects his calling in here. So we see the calling of Matthew starting in verse 9 there. You know, Matthew, many of you know, was a tax collector, right? So he was hated by the Jews. He was looked at as a traitor by some. You know, the more money he collected for Romans... His, his personal take was better, bigger. And Jesus came by and just looked at him. Two words, follow me. And instantly Matthew followed. Scripture tells us. Follow me, and he followed. You know, Jesus' purpose um, for all of us, but certainly these men in this illustration, was to heal all parts of us. I say all, not just the physical, not just the spiritual. Jesus wants to heal every part of us. Completion. And he interrupts our lives like he did Matthew's. You know, you're not a tax collector. Follow me. He interrupts our lives with life-changing, unearned offers of grace. Paralyzed man, easy to see. Physical issues, right? What about Matthew? Matthew was paralyzed too. He was paralyzed spiritually. Yet, Matthew and the paralyzed man's response was both the same. They both went all in. All in. They both responded to God and did exactly what he asked them to do. There's a cost to that. Certainly we can see the cost for Matthew perhaps better, clearer. Lost revenue, lost income, diminished income. Both of them had a change in life. God wants us to count the cost. In fact, Scripture tells us to count the cost. But you'll note that both men saw the cost of following Jesus and obedient, being obedient to Jesus as well worth it, because it is. And so a couple questions for you here tonight. First one, where do you need... I looked at this when I wrote this. Interesting. Where do you need an interruption in your life? You might say, well, I'd like to have an interruption here or be nice there. Where do you need an interruption? Perhaps how has your way of life trapped you? Maybe that means different things to you, you know. But just some thoughts there. When we don't believe in God's undeserved gift of the new life, we continue to wrestle with a guilty, confusing past, and we'll be faced with an anxious and uncertain future. But when we embrace the knowledge and security of God's gracious interruptions, our failures, even repeated ones, are free from drowning under the burden of sin, guilt, and shame. So our proper response to God's gracious interruption in our lives is simply to receive it and then get up and follow him. Let me say that again. Our proper response to God's interruption in our lives is to simply receive it and get up and follow him. Many times, easier said than done, right? We want that, but we need to depend on God to help us to do that. 
and to be obedient once we hear that calling. So we see that new life is worth celebrating. And as we move on in the scripture to verse 10, we see here that Jesus was having dinner at, having dinner? Yeah, Jesus was having dinner, scripture tells us, at Matthew's house with other tax collectors and other sinners, you know, people like you and I, sinners. Those privileged in authority with morally bankrupt, who knows, I, I just wrote down a list of some things here, you know, um, again, like in verse 12, Jesus responds differently. Different authority, because who it's from, gave a different posture, different response. His purpose was different than we see in human authority. Right? Authority means different things to different people. We're all under different authority or have different commands or structures. But his isn't self-centered. His isn't self-focused. It's not narcissistic. It's not driven by ambition, by greed, by politics, right? Rather, his, Scripture tells us in Philippians 2, is very different. Philippians 2 tells us, Jesus, being in the very nature of God, made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's a picture of him stooping, coming down. The greatest came down to serve and save the least. And so here the Pharisees, in their disdain again, their mumblings, their rumors, their whatever, you know, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors? I mean, What's going on? Again, who does he think he is? What's happening? It's, it's different to them, right? Different style, different format. It's not comfortable. Um, you know, does he know that what these people do? Does he know who they are? Looking down their nose, so to speak. His purpose is different. His purpose is different. You know, Jesus replied to them in Scripture here, it's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick, right? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. When we look at Jesus' words, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but come to call the sinners. He didn't distance himself from people. He didn't distance himself from sinners. You know, these different people groups that we might look at, judge, what other word might fit that? This was the core of his mission. Talking about purpose, the core of his mission. He ate with sinners because he came to save sinners. You know, drug dealers, prostitutes, the retired man, the grieving man, the successful lawyer, the military guy, the overworked businessman, the single mom, you, me, me. He wanted to eat with us because he came to save us. It mat didn't matter who you were, what your title was, what your status was. He'd eat with all of us because we're sinners and we're the people he came to save. Romans 3.23, and I'll stop there while you're writing that note perhaps and just um, make a pitch for BSF, Romans, like we're in... Matthew right now, Romans is another one of BSF studies. And so if you haven't gone through, or if you have gone through it, I'd encourage you to stick with us as we go through the cycles. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, you know, we are sinners. We don't talk like that sometimes, but we are. And our hope comes from Jesus who invites us to his table using that same dinner um, figure, if you will. God's grace is equally accessible to all people in all walks of life because his grace is for everybody. The people that you or I might think are the baddest people in the world. I'm not even going to go there, but he died for them. 
He wants to have dinner with them. He loves them. And so we need to, I need to as well. And in the course of this dinner then, John's disciples are there. We're picking up in verse 14 now back in Scripture. And John's disciples are saying same thing, starting to ask questions like the Pharisees, albeit different questions. And this is different. What's happening here? What's going on? Why, why is this happening? You know, really looking at feasting versus fasting. You know, we're fasting and you guys are feasting. What's, we have a disconnect. We're trying to reconcile that. You know, things look different. Help us understand that. And Jesus explains, using the illustration of the bridegroom, that there's a time to fast and there's a time to feast. And the time to feast is when the bridegroom is with you, as he was here. And the time to fast is a time of mourning when he's not here. And all through the next couple verses here, starting in 16, 17, other illustrations that they use in Scripture. You know, in 16, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment because a patch will pull away from the garment, right? Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins because if they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. So they pour new wine in new wineskins and both are preserved. these different illustrations to the people in that time that they'd understand the illustrations that this different authority didn't come using old methods. There were new methods. There were changes, right? He was there to give them a new way and to help shift their mindset. He came with the authority to give new life and to bring a new beginning. So some of your understanding, some of your traditions, some of your methods were going to change, needed to change. And that brings me to my first principle tonight, which is only Jesus has the authority to forgive sin and save sinners. Only Jesus has the authority to forgive sin and save sinners. So question, how are you following Jesus' example of befriending those caught in sin? <clears throat> He's sitting down having dinner with them, but... You know, he came to save them, but how are we befriending those caught in sin? As we looked at a couple weeks ago, Jesus declares us salt and light. And we're supposed to be salt and light to everybody, and specifically um, the unsaved and people still caught in sin. So my second division will flow a little faster here, but Jesus' authority over disease and death produced both faith and opposition. Faith and opposition, that's verses 18 to 34. Jesus' different authority begins with a different kind of power. You know, while he's speaking to John's disciples about the wineskins, he's still explaining that. We're going to see a series of interruptions here. You know, in verse 18, it's a synagogue leader interrupts them, kneels before them, actually silent at first, just comes up and kneels before them. And then looks up and says, my daughter has just died. Tragic, broken, hurt. But come and put your hand on her and she'll live. Faith, confidence in Jesus. And Jesus' response, he and his disciples went with him. They went to his house. But on the way there, <laughs> interruption. Verse 20, another interruption. Woman who had been bleeding 12 years heard Jesus was coming, came out to meet him. I can picture in my mind's eye, if you will, fighting through the crowd, and she just believed, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, just the hem, I don't even have to touch him, just the hem of the garment, I know that he can help me. I know that he can heal me. Think about that faith. All I have to do is touch the hem of his garment. So these intertwined stories of the woman, the synagogue leader, they're both stories of desperation. My daughter's dead. I've had all these medical, physical issues. Other parts of scripture tell us she'd been to all these doctors, 12 years, suffered hardship. One's dead, the other one might feel dead in context. But both are placing their faith in Jesus. Both will have their lives changed by him 
if they only experience his touch. Just his touch. Just his touch. Things will be different. Life will be restored. He was their last and only hope. Guess what? He's our last and only hope. Again, his different authority came with a different power. You know, so the woman with the bleeding issues, her belief captured Jesus' attention, but more than that, he felt her perhaps touch his garment, and he healed her. Verse 22 tells us he turned to her, engaged her, and said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. You believed all you had to do is touch my cloak to be healed. I'm confirming that you're here. And that scripture tells us the woman was healed at that very moment. So my question is, how about you? Are you weary of heart? Are you broken in spirit? Are you in need of a touch from the one who has the power to see past your physical circumstances? Perhaps see your emotional need? The message tonight for you, individually, collectively, your need is never too insignificant for his touch. Your need is never too insignificant for his touch. He cares about you, individually, personally. The story's intertwined, I said, so we pick up in verse 23. He arrives at the synagogue leader's house where the daughter had died. The funeral procession was going on. A lot of people, noisy, loud. And he instructs them to go away. Scripture tells us, he says, go away. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. Amazing. He wanted it quiet as I read that. You know, the noisy crowd, he dismissed them all. And then he went in quietly took her hand, led her as he wants to lead us, and brought her out by the hand, and she got up. And the news of that spread to the whole region. Jesus continues healing. Blind and mute, two blind men, Scripture tells us, approached him. Have mercy on us, son of David. And again, one of the names of God. I want to point that out if you're taking notes. Son of David. Jesus turns around and questions them. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? You want to be healed, but do you believe that I can heal you? And in verse 28, they answer him, yes, Lord. And so he touched them. Again, the touch. He touched them, and their sight was restored. Actually, he touched their eyes, and their sight was restored. And I found it interesting that Scripture says he commanded them or told them, see that no one knows about this. And it's recorded that they went out and told everybody. Presumably the excitement, right? So we continue on again, all these interruptions and all these healings. There was a demon-possessed mute man brought to Jesus, and Jesus drove the demon out of the man, and the man spoke first time ever. The crowd's a little overwhelmed. They're following him. They're seeing everything going on, the different people, healings, miracles. We're talking about miracles, right? They said nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. They don't know how to process some of it, perhaps. They've got their own questions, right? And then, of course, you've got the Pharisees coming in, trying to whatever. Um, verse 34 tells us that the Pharisees are saying, it's the prince of demons. That's the power behind him. If he drives out the demons, it's the prince of demons. Nah. This kind of power and authority can't be ignored. You know, you can't make stuff up. It can't be ignored. It, it demands a response. Not all authority is easy to submit to, Right? For you, neither for me. It's not easy submitting to all different kinds of authority. But, again, Jesus' authority is different. Different than any other authority. Because it comes with a potential offer of under, or excuse me, potential powerful offer of undeserved grace. 
grace that is life changing. Life changing. So my second principle for the night, only Jesus has the authority to overcome death and bring new life. Only Jesus. Couple questions here. Do you need to be restored tonight, now? Do you need to be restored? Do you need to have your sins forgiven and want to accept Jesus' gracious offer of salvation? He's offering that to you tonight. Is there some other area of your life that needs his powerful touch? Will you surrender to his authority, believing in his power to change you? Again, nothing in your life, nothing in your life is beyond his power to touch, his power to change. Before I close in prayer here tonight, on behalf of our entire team, I want to wish you and your family a blessed and happy Thanksgiving. And I don't miss the point that Holidays are difficult for some people. And with that said, we're praying for that as well as we pray for you. And uh, thank you for your commitment to BSF and for these groups and joining us online, our satellite discussion groups. Um, I would like to ask you in the context of these miracles and what we're studying, you know, Holidays are different for different people, right? And just purposefully ask God to help you as I am, as I am. This holiday with Thanksgiving coming up specifically, not even wait to them, to be more compassionate, to be more forgiving, and in so doing, to mirror more of Jesus' heart. So I just want to encourage you to do that. So we'll close in prayer, and then you're dismissed. Our dear Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for this group, Lord. Thank you for these men that come out and join us every week, including the satellite discussion groups and online groups. Thank you for how you speak to us through your word, through your spirit, through uh, just the different conversation in our individual discussion groups, Lord. Thank you for helping us to grow. Thank you for helping us to see and understand and better understand your love for us, all wrapped up in grace, Lord. Lord, I would pray tonight if there's any man here or in any of our groups or online that doesn't have a personal relationship with you, would you help them to just open their hearts to you, Lord, and just speak to one of us that tonight, according to your will, it could be that night. It could be a great and different Thanksgiving. And uh, for the rest of us, Lord, for those that or uh, getting together with family, or even in difficult circumstances, Lord, would you fill us with your grace and help us to extend that grace, your grace, to others. Thank you for your patience with us, your love for us, your forgiveness to us, and help us to be the men you want us to be. In your name we pray. Amen.